in the, in, in, in the presence of the truth, the bullshit disappears. Oh, hold on. Come on, man. Gotta put the R on top of the R. Exactly. There you go. Exactly, man. You know, that's the double R. You know? Why rappers were really scared of DMX. From going to jail more than 30 times to having feuds with massive names like Drake and Jay-Z, DMX was a rapper who had managed to intimidate the entire music industry with his antics. Right from the start, he managed to top all of the Billboard charts with his groundbreaking music, but his penchant for breaking the law eventually led to his downfall. This is the story of DMX and why other rappers were actually scared of him. Early Life DMX was born as Earl Simmons on December 18, 1970, in Mount Vernon, New York, and he was born to his 19-year-old mother, Arnett Simmons, and 18-year-old father, Joe Barker. As you can probably guess, this tale involved quite a lot of struggle. Young Earl found himself nestled in the middle of the family, with an elder sister named Bonita preceding him by two years. Later, his mother welcomed a daughter named Shayla, but this only happened after she had already endured the loss of two stillborn sons. Barker, Earl's father, found his peace in painting vibrant street scenes and selling his art at local fairs, a pursuit that led him to Philadelphia in pursuit of his artistic dreams. From the very beginning of his life, Simmons faced the harsh realities of life. He had to endure physical abuse at the hands of his own mother, all while he was struggling with bronchial asthma. Raised within the strict boundaries of the Jehovah's Witness faith, Earl's path took a significant turn after a life-altering accident. This was the point where he decided to sever his ties with the spirituality that once defined his existence. At the age of five, seeking refuge from the turmoil at home, his mother made the decision to send him to live with relatives in the school street, housing apartments of Yonkers. This move shifted the tide of the rest of his life. But the chaos in his life didn't end here either, and his life was marked by expulsion from middle school at the age of 10, which was followed by a stay in a group home. Returning to Yonkers at 15, he found himself on the unforgiving streets of that place, seeking his peace while hanging out with stray dogs and sitting in empty storage bins. It was no secret that Earl was struggling academically, which meant that his dreams of athletic fame were also dashed by poor grades. At this point, he had no idea what he wanted to do. Desperate times called for desperate measures, and Simmons found himself drawn into a life of crime. That's when he gave in to robbery to find the money to sustain himself because there was nothing else he could have done. From petty theft to carjacking, Earl had gone down a path of delinquency, which was fueled by him simply trying to survive as he wanted to carve out a place for himself in a society that had alienated him. But soon, things changed. The beginning of a career. Simmons was out in the streets of New York City in the mid-80s, a time when hip-hop was the most popular form of music, and dreams were born in the rhythmic beats pulsating through the urban sprawl. It all began in 1985, when Simmons found himself immersed in the world of rap, providing the beatbox accompaniment for a burgeoning local talent known as Ready Ron. Together, they set the stage on fire with their small shows, Ron commanding the mic while DMX lent his rhythmic abilities through beatboxing and ad-libs. Yet, as the spotlight illuminated Ron's rising star, DMX sensed a calling of his own, reinventing himself as a rapper under the name DMX, which was a cryptic acronym representing Divine Master of the Unknown, later evolving to the enigmatic Darkman X. However, fate dealt DMX a tumultuous hand, leading him down a path fraught with adversity and redemption. A two-year prison sentence became a crucible of transformation, where he honed his lyrical skills and engaged in fierce battles with fellow inmates, crafting a unique style known as Spellbound, where each word was meticulously spelled out letter by letter. Amidst the confines of incarceration, alliances and rivalries were forged, none more notable than his encounters with K-Solo, a harbinger of future conflicts and collaborations. I got a, 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 a huge weight on my shoulders, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm responsible for my music, you know what I'm saying? And, and each album has to do many things. DMX's journey shifted in January 1991, when he was seen on the airwaves of the Stretch Armstrong and Bobito show and delivered a freestyle that shook the audiences. It even managed to gather praise from the Source magazine's unsigned hype column. But all these achievements didn't just die down and go to waste. These accolades made the way for a management deal with the label Rough Riders Entertainment. This is where DMX's tumultuous yet transformative journey through the music industry truly began. Then the year of 1991 came, and Columbia Records saw DMX's shining talent, after which they signed him to its subsidiary labels Chaos Records and Roughhouse Records, 
but his major debut single, Born Loser, didn't really make any waves with audiences. They simply couldn't resonate with that stuff, and it led to a premature termination of his contract with the company. Despite the massive setback, DMX was not discouraged, and he embraced his brand new independence to finally carve a path of his own. In the middle of all these trials and obstacles in his way, a beacon of hope emerged in the form of Irv Gotti, who was a trusted confidant and president of A&R at Def Jam Recordings. In May 1997, DMX's hard work paid off as he made a deal with Def Jam Recordings. After that came the late 90s, which witnessed the unbelievable rise of DMX in the music scene. This progression was fueled by a string of hit singles and multi-platinum albums that solidified his status as a rap icon. From the infectious energy of Get At Me Dog to the anthemic feeling of Rough Rider's Anthem, DMX was able to capture the audience's attention with his raw lyrical masterpieces and charismatic stage presence. A historic milestone came into DMX's life in December 1998 with the release of Flesh of My Flesh, Blood of My Blood, as he became the first rapper since Tupac Shakur to achieve consecutive number one Billboard 200 albums within a year. His third album, And Then There Was X, continued this streak of success as it debuted at number one on the charts and spawned the chart-topping single, Party Up, Up In Here. Beyond the recording studio, DMX had a massive impact on popular culture as well, making a cameo appearance in the Sum 41 music video and joining the anger management tour alongside luminaries like Limp Biscuit and Godsmack. But amidst all this success, DMX remained grounded in his roots, and he was able to channel his pain and passion into his music almost effortlessly. His later career. A, a lot of the love I had for wanting to, you know, for wanting to be a part of the industry is not there anymore. I'm not, I'm not, I don't even associate myself with the industry, you know what I'm saying? One of the reasons that rappers were so scared of DMX was because of the success that he had managed to gain through his work. They knew that whenever he got back on stage, he would be ruling the music industry like nobody else can. Between 2001 and 2004, DMX found himself back in the studio after getting himself through some legal issues, and he was determined to reclaim his throne. With his fourth album, The Great Depression, dropping on October 23rd, 2001, he was reaching brand new heights once again, this album debuted at the top of the Billboard 200 and had hit singles like Who We Be, We Right Here, and I Miss You, all of which went on to become excessively famous among the audiences. Sure, the album had platinum success, but its reception paled in comparison to its earlier triumphs, setting the stage for a roller coaster ride of highs and lows. In September 2003, DMX came out with his fifth studio album, Grand Champ, which signaled his return to dominating the charts once again. As always, he claimed the coveted number number one spot on the Billboard 200 with his album, which featured chart-topping singles like Where the Hood At and Get It On The Floor. But in the middle of the happiness he felt when it came to his resurgence, DMX stunned fans with the revelation that Grand Champ would mark his swan song. This was his declaration that he intended to say goodbye to the rap game and ride off into the sunset of retirement. But fate had other plans for the troubled rapper because he found himself knee-deep in a dispute with Def Jam Records, which led to a massive shift in his career trajectory. In January 2006, DMX signed with Columbia Records, Def Jam's former parent company, all just to reclaim his creative freedom. And here began his quest to complete his sixth album, Year of the Dog Again, an album that was constantly plagued by delays and setbacks, all thanks to his allegiance to two labels. Even after all the chows, Year of the Dog Again made its long, awaited debut on August 1, 2006, and secured the second spot on the Billboard 200. But critical reception was pretty mixed, and it left DMX at a crossroads as he struggled to figure out what was going on with his career. In the following years, DMX's musical output reduced as he found himself fighting off personal demons and dealing with legal entanglements. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you listen to a whole album, mm -hmm. pick a single, shoot a video, then don't know? Mm -hmm. Hmm, okay, I see what's really good. You're trying to eliminate the competition. Still, he managed to remain clear-headed and focused in his pursuit of redemption. This was the point where he started channeling his faith into a gospel music album and contemplating a career in preaching. At this time, he was on a hiatus from the spotlight, but DMX's influence still endured, with Def Jam Records releasing compilation albums celebrating his storied legacy. In October 2011, DMX was back on the stage of the 2011 Bet Hip Hop Awards, which confirmed his deeply awaited return to the forefront of the rap scene. With his sights set on his seventh album, aptly titled Undisputed, he was now on a quest to reclaim his rightful place among hip hop legends, and he would stop at nothing else. Despite countless delays, 
Undisputed finally saw the light of day on September 11, 2012, featuring collaborations with the leading figures in the industry, like Swizz Beats and MGK. As the years rolled by, DMX's life saw yet another twist with his reunion with Def Jam Recordings in September 2019, which almost seemed like a homecoming for the rapper. Two years later, in May 2021, DMX's album, Exodus, was released, but this would eventually prove to be his last album. The feuds DMX held. Our fellow rappers have always been a bit wary when being around DMX, but why is that? It's the raw emotion of DMX, always unfiltered and unpredictable, as described by Fred Rose Starr in an interview. And I ain't got time to be playing no kid games, man. So once I see I'm not dealing with a man and he disrespects me, I'm breaking jaw. DMX's presence, he says, is like walking on eggshells, never knowing what might happen next. As Jay Farrow recounts, DMX's punches could accidentally find their way to your face, leaving you dazed and confused. Or worse yet, he might just steal your girl, robbing you of your chance with the girl in question. Take the tale of Maka, for instance, who, as a teenager, found himself in a hotel room with a DMX fan he met at a Canadian nightclub. Things took an unexpected turn when DMX himself intervened, claiming the girl had left her purse behind, much to Maka's bewilderment. But if this incident caused a few chuckles, another encounter with a different girl escalated into a full-blown beef, courtesy of the notorious DMX. Why? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not into the, you know, just just for nothing type You know, I, I don't do that. You know what I'm saying? You know, there has to be a reason. It has to be, you know, something that was done to me. It was the competitive landscape of the 90s when DMX found himself involved in complex relationships with fellow rising stars Jay-Z and Jay Rule. The trio had worked together quite a lot, and their chemistry was clearly undeniable as they formed the group known as Inc. But beneath this facade of their friendship, there were simmering tensions, particularly between DMX and Jay-Z. This led to an internal conflict within Murder, Inc., which eventually reached a breaking point, and that's how the group disbanded forever. But that's not where the story ends. After it was all done, DMX went all out in interviews, calling Ja Rule out and accusing him of being nothing but an imitator. He even asserted that Ja Rule had swiped his trademark gruff delivery style, which must have hit the mark. But the feud got much worse with the release of the scathing diss track They Want War on a 2002 DJ K Slay mixtape, and this was a direct shot at Ja Rule from DMX. But Ja Rule was completely silent in response, and this lack of reaction didn't sit very well with the rapper. So DMX further intensified the feud with the single Go To Sleep. This was a track featuring Eminem and OB Trice, and he didn't hold back at all when it came to targeting Ja Rule with his bidding lyrics. Now, as time passed it and the bitter feelings between them went away, DMX said that he wanted to bury the hatchet after his release from prison in 2005. Despite this, it wasn't until 2009 that DMX and Ja Rule actually ended their fight, and this event marked a massive turning point in their strange relationship. Simultaneously, tensions between DMX and Jay-Z had been brewing since the early 1990s, stemming from a rap battle that fueled DMX's deep-seated hatred for the rap mogul. Even as the years went by and the fight cooled down, sparks reignited when DMX, in an Instagram video, challenged Jay-Z to a rap battle on Verzu's. This basically was fueled to the fire of their long-standing rivalry. But there's a lot more to DMX's feuds than that. The rumor mill churned in 2007, whispering about DMX's involvement with Foxy Brown, his then-girlfriend. Allegations flew as they both shared the stage during Def Jam's Survival of the Illest Tour and even collaborated on the track Dog and a Fox. Corrupt, feeling his concept was pilfered for the song, retaliated in his diss track, calling out names. Foxy Brown, completely denied any romantic involvement with DMX and shifted the blame to Eve for spreading the gossip, sparking a beef between Foxy Brown and Eve. DMX, never one to back down, fired back with his track, Party Up. His antics also included his particularly humorous take on Rick Ross's rap style, poking fun at his penchant for eating and wooing women. Another incident involved DMX's spirited chase after Mace on a Miami beach, leaving witnesses in awe of his intensity. Then, there was his disdain for Drake, expressed in colorful language and a wish to confront him in an elevator. DMX's love for dogs, however, took center stage in tales of robbery, where he once used his loyal companion to intimidate a reporter into surrendering his belongings. Stories of confiscating chains at gas stations only added to the legend of DMX. The troubles DMX had with the law. Jump up the car, I'm like, yo! <laughs> All right, I might have asked for his license. <laughs> <laughs> In DMX's entire life, he had been to jail over 30 times, 
which meant that he had a hefty history as a criminal. Was this the biggest reason rappers were scared of him? It's an intriguing perspective. His legal problems spanned a number of charges, from possession of illegal firearms to robbery, assault, and even animal cruelty. It all began as early as 1986 when, as a young offender, he landed in Woodfield Prison's juvenile unit after stealing a dog from a junkyard. His sentence there was brief before a subsequent two-year sentence in upstate New York's industry institution ensued. However, in a daring escape just days into his term, DMX fled, only to surrender later, under his mother's urging to complete his sentence at the McCormick Juvenile Detention Center. The cycle of incarceration continued in 1988 with a carjacking charge, culminating in a transfer to a maximum security facility following an extortion attempt on a fellow inmate. By the summer of 88, DMX found temporary freedom. In 1999, a run-in with the Fort Lee Police Department led to weapons possession charges, prompting a swift surrender. So I slave to say, what I want to do, I do not. What I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. A year later, a brush with animal cruelty allegations in Teaneck, New Jersey, threatened DMX's freedom, resolved through public service announcements and accountability. During the early 2000s, DMX got arrested several times, including a 15-day sentence that he had to serve for having marijuana with him in 2000. This was followed by a more serious sentence in 2001 for driving without a license and assaulting prison guards, which showed that, no matter what happened, the rapper did not want to leave his devious streak behind. In January 2000, in 2002, DMX's legal troubles got much worse with guilty pleas to numerous charges. At this point, his public image began to improve because he embraced community service and public service announcements. The crescendo came in June 2004 at John F. Kennedy International Airport, where a string of charges, including cocaine possession and impersonating a federal agent, landed him in legal hot water once again. Despite a conditional discharge in 2004, DMX faced parole violations in 2005, resulting in a 70-day stint at Rikers Island, extended due to tardiness, but ultimately curtailed for good behavior just before the year's end. In 2007, there was a raid on DMX's house which left the nation shocked, but authorities alleged animal cruelty, which made matters much worse. The years that came after that saw the rapper involved in a series of legal battles spanning across different states and charges. From 2008 to 2011, Arizona and California were where DMX was going through his trials. Later, he was arrested in Cave Creek, Arizona, in May 2008 on drug and animal cruelty charges, which eventually led to him pleading guilty to various offenses, including theft and drug possession, in December 2008. I actually didn't get in any trouble. I was never arrested at the scene of any crime I, or, you know, the police came and arrested me for something. Despite a brief taste of freedom in 2010 after serving part of a six-month sentence, DMX's run-ins with the law didn't change at all, leading to even more arrests down the road, including one for reckless driving in Los Angeles in 2010. Then there was another arrest for probation violations in Arizona in 2010 and 2011, but August 2011 marked yet another arrest for speeding in Maricopa County, Arizona. It almost seemed like DMX just couldn't manage to stay out of jail, doing one wrong thing after the other. This continued in 2013, when DMX got arrested for multiple different offenses in South Carolina, from driving without a license in Spartanburg to DUI charges in Greenville County. In August of the same year, an arrest in Greer, South Carolina, further compounded DMX's legal troubles when Merrill was found in the car he was driving. But then, in November 2013, he was caught once again on the charges of driving with a suspended license. Coming back to his hometown in 2015, DMX ended up facing some harsh accusations of robbery in New Jersey and child support payment failures, after which he was sentenced to six months in jail for the latter in July 2015. The rapper's legal trouble persisted into December of the same year when an arrest warrant was issued for missing a court hearing related to child support. But the worst of it all came in 2017. This was when DMX was charged with tax fraud by federal prosecutors, accused of failing to file income tax returns between 2010 and 2015. Pleading guilty to a single count of tax fraud in November 2017, DMX wasn't out of trouble yet. Things got much more intense when he was sent to jail in January 2018 for leaving a court-ordered drug treatment program. DMX was then sentenced to one year in prison in March 2018, which was to be followed by three years of supervised release and a large restitution fee. Finally, he was released in 2019. His personal life 
The life of DMX was not without its spiritual and personal complexities. A devout born-again Christian, he found solace in the scriptures, claiming to immerse himself in the Bible daily, even during his stints behind bars, where he believed he had a divine purpose to fulfill. He claimed that he came there to meet somebody, even though he didn't know who it was, but he believed that he would know when he saw him. His religious fervor extended beyond mere belief as he pursued ordination as a pastor, embracing his calling with the zeal he displayed in his music. Yet, amidst his spiritual journey, DMX navigated a turbulent personal life, fathering a staggering 17 children with 11 different women, a testament to the complexities of his relationships. Yeah, yeah. you and your, I don't want to, is it wife, ex-wife? Um, uh, ex-wife. Okay. Yeah, we so soulmate, you, though. We, we, exactly, we still like the best of friends, you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, that's never gonna change, man. I'm grateful for that. His marriage with childhood sweetheart Tashera Simmons, which spanned 11 years, yielded four children. But their marriage eventually crumbled under the weight of his legal troubles, culminating in a separation in 2010, though they remained amicable. However, accusations of missed child support payments surfaced, adding strain to their already fraught relationship. Legal battles over paternity and child support ensued with other women, including Patricia Trejo and Monique Wayne, each claiming DMX as the father of their children. Despite court-ordered settlements and genetic testing confirming his paternity, the tumult persisted. The complexities of DMX's life extended to his financial realm, where bankruptcy filings punctuated his struggles. Three times he sought financial relief, citing child support obligations as his primary concern. Yet his efforts were met with legal challenges, with his initial filing dismissed by the U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Manhattan in 2013. How DMX died it's just those moments, like drops of water in the ocean, when they come together, you see the beauty of, 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 of who you are and why you are. He had confessed to falling into the grip of crack cocaine at a tender age of 14 after being lured by Reddy Ron, who deceived him into smoking a marijuana joint laced with the perilous substance. Although Reddy Ron refuted this claim after Simmons' death, addiction haunted DMX throughout his life, leading him to seek solace in drug rehabilitation multiple times. These included his stints in rehabilitation in the years 2002, 2017, and 2019, which often resulted in the cancellation of scheduled performances, leaving fans and loved ones deep deeply concerned for his well-being. One of the darkest hours came on February 10th, 2016, when DMX was found unconscious in a Yonkers parking lot, his life hanging by a threat. First responders gave him Narcon, a drug designed to counteract an opioid overdose, which miraculously brought him back from the brink of death. Rushed to the hospital, he blamed the incident on an asthma attack, but witnesses claimed he had consumed a mysterious powder beforehand, a detail disputed by law enforcement's failure to uncover illicit substances at the scene. Then, on April 2nd, 2021, DMX was taken to White Plains Hospital after experiencing a heart attack at his house which was possibly triggered by a drug overdose, and he was instantly plunged into a critical state. As news of his dire condition spread, the world held its breath, hoping for a miracle, but hope faded as reports confirmed that the rapper was on life support. His attorney, Murray Richmond, confirmed the grim reality, and fans all over the world knew what was coming next. Despite valiant efforts by medical professionals, Simmons went through cerebral hypoxia during resuscitation attempts, leaving him in a vegetative state with failing lungs and brain function a heartbreaking revelation that was told by his former manager Nakia Walker and SRC and Loud Records founder Steve Rifkin. The morning of April 9, 2021, brought only disappointment as DMX's organs began to fail in a way that was not reversible, and the rapper died at the age of 50. Months later, the truth behind his death emerged, with the Westchester County Medical Examiner's Office attributing his passing to a cocaine-induced heart attack, even in death. DMX's legacy was clouded by legal wrangling, as the absence of a will ignited probate battles over his estate, underscoring the intricate tapestry of triumphs and tribulations that define the life of this troubled yet immensely talented artist. That's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, click on the boxes playing on your screen to watch similar content.